Uh, we're here with Debbie Hannon and Travis Alabansa, the wonderful creators of Sound of the Underground. And we're going to take a few questions, but I want to start just by asking you guys a few things about the show, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Great. Hi. So, one of the things that I know you wrote in your author's note was about labor. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The really exciting bit of the author's note. You know, very riveting. Yeah, yeah. Very riveting it's conversation. about labor. Go on. And yeah. you guys talked about um, how you split the labor between you and how you yeah. created different roles for this process. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it came from actually Travis in quite a revolutionary way, acknowledging that when a director and writer works with each other, those aren't particularly clean-cut lanes. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging that when we work with each other, they really aren't. It's really not as clean as, like, Travis works alone in a room on a mountaintop and then sends me a script. Yeah, definitely. And I make some actors do it. It's just not that at all. So we wanted to acknowledge the fact that it was much more, that we built it together from the concept up um, and that we were not staying in our lanes at all, actually, in, in a really healthy, brilliant way. But rather than ignoring that and crediting it as usual and not thinking about how we were paid or what royalties we were, we wanted to dig into that and actually change it up to reflect that better. Yeah. So, I mean, Travis wrote uh, all the words, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, and, and didn't she kill it? Um, hey. and, uh, uh, and I did direct it, but those things are much more porous and much more fluid than those um, headings say at first, especially yeah. in this. Because yeah. I think with new writing, sometimes, um, you don't just write it and put it on stage. A director's obviously normally doubling up as a dramaturg as mm. well, often a lot of the time. It's building the structures, building the arc. And I found when we worked on Overflow, um, a lot of the things that people were congratulating me on were actually things that Debbie had done. <laughs> and I was like, this doesn't really feel good because I've done my bit and I've done all right with the word play. Um, but actually this thing that you're saying wouldn't have happened if Debbie hadn't sat down and spent time that is often uncredited. Um, so we are splitting the royalties between us. Um, I fought to also, well, I didn't fight. You it did. wasn't like, well, yeah, to get um, Debbie's name on the sign as well. Yeah. And I think that um, it's a tech, yeah. Yeah, not in, like a well, not in like a well done way, but in a way that if you're going to make a show about work yeah. and you're going to make a show that talks about work and labor, then you also have to examine it from like the moment you start as well. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of separation of your own ego. Right? Oh, that went a long time ago. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think when you have a play text get published with like more than four spelling mistakes, that ego goes out the window. <laughs> out the window, out the window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Working with drag performers removes the ego. Yeah. No, yeah. Huh. yeah. Tell me more. Tell me more. If they don't like a line, they'll just, you know, I've never seen fuck off said on a face um, <laughs> in so many diverse ways, you know? <laughs> So what was, how was it uh, getting them to like build a group dynamic, right? I know drag artists usually work solo, they're kind of divas, you know? Um, I don't know, if, I don't, know to, I mean, I wouldn't say not divas, okay. but um, I would say that they're just like really independent yeah. um, solo artists yeah. who are, yeah. who have to flourish in quite a difficult economy and in a competitive space where uniqueness is at the top of the game. So that naturally makes people who, are, who have to live, who have to fill out the full extent of their personality to its absolute fullest. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot be back footed in that space. Yeah. So you've got people who are used to asserting themselves and have vision. Um, and there is a sort of maybe culture in new writing of like the actors and the director serving the script. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and it doesn't, and it's like gross and <laughs> controversial. And um, <laughs> at the, <laughs> the royal court stage, I know. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and also not true, like yeah. it's actually not true. But even a process where the play ends up looking more traditional, I don't think that's actually a true part of the process. It's yeah. this sort of strange, quite English, uh, mm -hmm. sublimation culture that comes um, and actually the thing is that no one who walked into our room in this cast had bought into revering this building revering the art of new writing revering the writer revering <laughs> either of us yeah <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> um, so, so yeah well, so they weren't so much divas as, well, as much as they were fully fledged flourishing artists who knew what they were about yeah, yeah. Um, and everything that, that brings with it yeah and you wouldn't you wouldn't get the show that we got to see yeah. if they weren't fully aware of themselves and the decisions that they will and won't make. Yeah. And does that mean that sometimes decisions take longer? Absolutely. But I think what it means is that you see them as their fullest self in that last act. You see what they're doing when they push themselves. And also you're getting to see that um, like that solo artists 
know already how to do theatrics and know how to make their own plot, know how to make their own tension, know how to make, um, sub they already do all of that in mm -hmm. the clubs all the time in three minutes uh, with no budget and no team. And so I think why waste that? Because if you can make a career off of doing that with uh, three minutes on stage, then we should be listening to you when you're in the room with us now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. How, so obviously these performers are a big part of the creation of the work. How did you find them? How did you choose them? Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> um, yeah, we did an open call. Yeah. We did an open call. So it was a real... I, I used to work in the clubs, and that's why I did the show. I come from the club scene. I did all my first performances. So it, it was tempting to go, I already know which performers I want. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was reminded by um, one of the performers, well, you've not been in the club scene for a very long time, babes. <laughs> and I said five years. They said a long time. I went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we did an open call, and we had over 600 auditions. Wow. Uh, people applied. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we decided we couldn't see all of them. Um, but we did a kind of X Factor Judges Houses style. Um, <laughs> with, with 40. With 40. In person, yeah. 40 in person kind of workshop auditions to see how they can work in a team, to see mm. how they can work on their feet and stuff like mm. that. And then from that, we um, picked our eight. It was a really hard um, like process of Debbie and I. Um, just like we battled it out, really. Yeah. It yeah. was, it, we had to find, it, we could have cast any one of those 40, is mm -hmm. the complete truth. And it was about finding an alchemy of the set of people who spoke to the range of humans in the community, who, and the range of skill as yeah. well. You know, if one person was a stand-up, we didn't want another one. You know, uh, to find people who could speak to that whole thing authentically, accurately, and absolutely are at the top of their game yeah. was, was the goal, which we did. And also people who were willing and able to speak about their experiences. Yeah, yeah. you had to, uh, we, had, we did a two-week R&D about two minutes ago, um, in June or something. And uh, we, it was, it was kind of the first time you talked about how you form a group. Well, that was the first time that this set of performers had spent their daytimes together. Yeah. Like, it's a nightlife practice, and suddenly you're doing 10 to 6 in office hours and having a lunch break, and <laughs> as equity demands, and um, uh, <laughs> discussing your vulnerable thoughts about pay and who gets paid more and why. Yeah. And actually, that was a formative moment in the group to actually reach by the end of those weeks the point where you could speak about what it means to receive the money you do and the person next to you doesn't. Yeah, definitely. So how did you guys go about actually building that community with them, right? Being able to like, get them to a point where they could speak about those things, where they could build their own work, Right. Oh my God, such a good question. Um, I think, honestly, like giving, like listening. Yeah. I mean that really. Wow. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I say where I take out my phone to check the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, really, I mean that really literally. I don't mean it in like a sort of weird Tory listening exercise way. I mean like, I mean like in a like really specifically asking and listening. And actually, I, quite a few of them said like that isn't a thing. Our voices weren't held in that way before. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, just actually making space in the sense that we didn't have to do that much work because once we'd asked, yeah. there was a lot delivered. to take. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There was yeah. so much being delivered. Very, yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of them were also like despite the comment from my friend in the cast saying I hadn't been in the club scene for a while, I feel like it was just yesterday that I was in the clubs, because it was. Yeah. And uh, I remember that, you know, there's a weird sensation when you're doing all of your shows at night time, and often in part of a lineup, that you kind of actually never also physically speak. Unless yeah. your act is like vo live vocal, sometimes you actually don't make a noise out of your mouth, and then you go off stage and people clap. And I think that that means there's all these things that get left unsaid and you try mm. and make a democracy in the dressing room. But a lot of the time that dressing room comes with its own politics and with its own drama and with its own things. So I think actually like once we kind of said that this is only gonna work if we talk and listen to each other, yeah, the floodgates kind of mm. opened in that sense. And how else, I guess I'm interested in how these performers might be internalized or processed in the theater versus the club, right? You spend a lot of time in the play talking about like these archetypal audience members who move between those spaces. So I'm interested in how the context might change or shift the way um, a performer might internalize that space or, or the audience might internalize the performer. I think 
it's like not as binary as you think. Yeah. I think um, there's like an offer to the audiences that come from the club world and the cabaret world, mm -hmm. but it there's the, those worlds aren't as like bo I, I started in clubs as well, just like literally yeah. in the previous century, and um, <laughs> uh, and so like that that pipeline of club to theatre both aesthetically, but also the humans that are there, is much more linked than you think. Yeah. And I think what the context does is allow for subversion in mm. this space. Yeah. And it's not as simple as like the glory is authentic and deep and real, and here is like institutionalized and awful. We've actually created like a sort of tunnel between the two yeah. that talks to both. And that, you know, at, like my, my partner, for instance, had never seen a cabaret before this show, Ooh. and is now like, can we go to the glory, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and there's something kind of brilliant about that. that that also being as true as the fact that we've got audiences in here who'd never stepped forth in this building before because it wasn't previously for them. And now it's absolutely for them because once Sue gives a fuck and there'll be snatch dragon tramps through the audience, <laughs> um, the building is now yours. So I think, I think in terms of how it's being digested, there's maybe a greater degree of reflection here. Mm -hmm. Like it's more than three minutes. It's two hours. There's a vulnerable moment of lip sync. Yeah, there's a process has um, changed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's mm -hmm. taking you through that through the night. So it's mm -hmm. giving you more space and reflection and time and moment beyond the spectacle. But actually, really, the reason it ends in a cabaret is to bring you back to that version of the interaction and yeah. to go, what is celebration and what is art when it's left, um, I was gonna say left unchecked yeah. and resourced at the same time. Um, so in a way, it's, it's trying to do both, but go come this way because you're spending a lot of time in this rarefied air thinking that this is the better art. Right. So, but let's journey you back to this other place where it originated from. Oh. That you've talked, you've taken the aesthetic from, like that really long speech in *The Devil Wears Prada*, but it's really in blue. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, reference, correct. <laughs> yeah, hey. you're leaking our mood board. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite things to ask artists uh, before I open it up to the audience is, "What failed?" <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Too it's an aggressive soon, question. Too soon. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, we can accept that we're gonna fail. Yeah, 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 you know, it's a yeah, constant yeah, failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Con constant. Constant failure. Constant failure. Constant failure. Constant failure. <sighs> Ooh, that's a bit hard. That's a bit emotional because I think I'm still really processing it. Yeah. And so it's quite hard. This is the first time I've really felt the timeline of fear being just like wild, in the sense that you do this really long process right up until previews, and then you have to celebrate on press night with all these new people that are excited. And then you have to celebrate when you get good reviews. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to celebrate good reviews and then celebrate bad reviews from the Times all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it's hard then to process at the same time what, what failed. I think, I'll be honest, and I say, I'll say that I didn't, I underestimated how many, how forceful of a structure, the way theatres work are, mm. and how much um, people and power it would take to really change those structures. And I think before I was like assuming that there's a person at the end of this structure going, no, we don't want this to change. And what I learned from this experience is even when people do want it to change, it's so embedded in how we work in this industry that even when both people want it to change and the person on the side wants to change and even the person across from Sloan Square who has nothing to do with it also wants it to change, <laughs> four weeks isn't long enough to like change all of that. Mm. And so that was really hard to look at those failures and be like, I can see this failing and actually yeah. this needed us to rewind and hire another person or rewind and um, change rehearsal times or rewind mm. and say actually, this is not how ticketing should work for in these ways. You know, all these things that you yeah. just can't catch. Um, yeah, that would be my, my thing that failed. Um, and also, I would never normally do a video with holes in my tights, and this is being filmed. <laughs> it's just texture. It's been a long process. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think... Um, I'm going to take what Travis said and go a bit further with in terms of what they're referencing mm -hmm. is about disability, actually. I'm going to be really explicit about it. And neurodivergence. Yeah. And our, our cast has a range of disabilities and neurodivergences, as does our offstage team as well. Um, and we, we entered this process trying to examine 
everything to do with how we were working. Like every single element of it, we were fucking way too ambitious. Um, but we did it anyway. Um, and now we're really tired. Um, and <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the thing that actually I think surprised both of us, even though I am disabled and have an invisible disability, is still how unprepared for change that area was. Mm -hmm. And I think theatre has had a reckoning about some identities, and not particularly, maybe, it's like, I'm not saying it's done at all, it's maybe had like a 1% change or something better, but in terms of disability, there's been very little move, very yeah. little shift. And actually, we learnt, uh, even though we tried to put everything in place and spoke things aloud and did all the training, we learnt too late about some of the things we should have done. Yeah. And, and that's hard. Yeah, and that's a learning that will go on and it will go into the next thing and we'll debrief on it and I, I hope we find a way to not just send it into an institutional pipeline and pack it away and pretend that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but we, as the two people who are facilitating and holding this, that's the thing we had to keep holding each other on and yeah. go, okay, we need to reassess because that, that's not good enough yet. And actually, disability is dynamic, neurodivergence is dynamic. There's mm -hmm. not one answer that you can put on a form and that still doesn't quite work. Um, yeah. So yeah, we learned a lot. And institutions can be quite attached to labor and like pr you know producing, right? And that doesn't make totally. a lot of space for like actually pausing and actually understanding what yeah. someone has the ability to do in yes. any given role. There is always yeah. the clock ticking down. The show must go on. Right. And what does that mean? Who is that? Who is that costing us? Right. And like yeah. even Majit, for instance, in the show has to have some shows off. Mm -hmm. And. That, that, in every other context, that would be a no for that performer then. You don't right. get to have some shows off. What right. are you talking about? It's the theatre! <laughs> <laughs> um, but that wasn't a no for us. So we built two versions of the show. One where they're in it, one where they're represented by a giant cardboard cutout. <laughs> <laughs> and we've recorded their speeches because it, they've made an indelible mark in the fabric of the show. So just because they were disabled doesn't mean you should remove them. And their value is inherent. Yeah. Good. 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 Okay. But we should have asked for more tech time for that. Oh. <laughs> There's never enough tech time. There's never enough tech time, baby. Uh, I want to open up to any questions for you. Any questions for Travis and Debbie from you guys? So the question was, what were the original germinating seeds for the production, and what was it like sort of getting it into this glorious institution that is the Royal Court? Yeah, so I guess I can talk about the idea, and then mm. you talk about the process. Um, I think it actually started even with Overflow, setting yeah. the toilet, which was never actually specifically at the beginning a club toilet, and then watching it kind of morph into one, made me realize there was so much I wanted to talk about, about the clubs, and also like how much I missed them, if I'm honest, and how much that I got told that going from club to doing all these shows was like an incline in success, and feeling really resistant to what that equals and what that means that they look at in terms of other people. Um, but also I love work about the club and I love work that archives the club and theorizes the club. I'm actually about to shout out a book that I thought I would have time to get in the bar, but I'm gonna ask that they just bring it here because I'm gonna rush to get a train. Um, but I want us all to pre-order Harry Nichols' book, A Trans Man Walks Into a Gay Bar. Mm. Um, I'm, yeah, there we go, take notes, perfect, love that. <laughs> it's called A Trans Man Walks Into a Gay Bar. Um, and I'm really excited to read it because I'm excited to read all of our kind of conversations about what it means to be in queer spaces mm. that aren't these kind of like, um, like not real ones. We can't talk about queer spaces and like, well, no, talk about what we're actually talking about. A lot of the places we still gather as queers in clubs. Mm. And it feels like, especially at this moment, I hate to bring up like, no, I like to bring up topical things. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I'm saying I don't like it. But like even this conversation around Sam Smith mm. and like purity and all this weird place that everyone's going to. Mm. I'm like, ugh, this is so weird. Have you gone into a gay club? <laughs> like, <laughs> have you gone to a queer club? And I'm worried about how the push for like perfection and the pu push for like perfection in our morals, but also perfection in the kind of art we like, is stripping away things about queerness that I think the club never loses. Mm -hmm. And so when Vicky asked me what kind of thing I would want to do here, I had a couple of ideas of my next project, but I thought about what place uh, fits a fall, like what place goes right up against <laughs> something messy. Well, when a writer, a new young writer, <laughs> gets the main stage at the Royal Court, well, oh, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna show us the best writing of a play they've ever done? How are they gonna be so topical and so genre busting? And it was like, fuck that, that's yeah. so boring. What people would I bring in 
that would mean that even if I wanted to try and do that, it would be impossible. Uh, that would be the performance from the club. And yeah, I just, that was the, the thing. And then I, I tested it at Living Newspaper in lockdown. I brought Sharon Legrand in to do like a seven minute monologue here. And um, it was baffling for so many audience members and I thought, brilliant, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> And then they, sorry, then they asked me who I wanted to direct, and I thought, well, there we go, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, yeah. Then, really, pra practi really practically, we then booked two weeks of R&D. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, we did the auditions, because we knew we had to build it around the performers, that's the thing. Like, no matter what the rest of the development was, it was about those performers, so actually everything then became about that. Um, and from there, it's probably actually pretty typical in terms of uh, the usual thing of what an R&D is, but we just had to absolutely meet them where they are and build it from there. And, and it was really, it started with me and Travis uh, going for a cocktail down the road and going, <laughs> do you think this should have three acts? Yeah, I think so. Maybe four, no, three. It was kind <laughs> of like that. So yeah, and it kind of went yeah. from there. <laughs> the question is, what does queer time mean to each of us? It means that when you tell the cast to come in at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> The show at 12. Um, I guess it's... Uh, do you know what? If I'm being honest, that <coughs> bit in the script is actually a jab at queers. Um, yeah. I've heard queers, like, say that phrase so many times in the same vein as, like, star sign chat. Um, <laughs> and I've heard queers be like, queer time, it's fluid. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I wanted something that kind of took the piss out of what queers say so that then Sadie and Reese could make the joke I think funnier and add the like uh, that whole bit is about taking the piss out of like queer language because then Sadie obviously goes points to her skin with Reese and then goes you've got to be intersectional which is obviously I think just funny but also taking the piss out of uh, yeah just queer language that I was getting a bit bored of if I'm honest and bored of queers using and not getting and um, that feels like a cop out so I will say that also on top of that I guess um Queer time was a way of also mentioning it a few times because people were waiting for that act one to do something. So I know that the whole of audience, we've got that clock ticking, there's all these long pauses, we take all <laughs> that time for the tea. Time, it, Majit takes ages to come and get a lighter and says nothing's urgent here. Like time, we're really telling you like we don't care about your time. And so <laughs> the fact that it's then mentioned multiple times, oh Majit's a performance artist, so double late, oh, I'm non-binary, extra late. It's just like we know and are aware that this is taking a bit longer than you want. And that's how we feel when we've watched every single kitchen sink drama. Uh, For real. <laughs> For real. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> you have any thoughts about queer time? Yeah, I think, um, I'm gonna, at the risk of sending wank, um, the, <laughs> but why not? Uh, the like theatre, the medium of theatre is for me time. I'm mm -hmm. I'm building something that takes place over a certain amount of hours in a night. Like I've I've got you for like two and a half hours, so it's my job to then work out what that event is using all the material that life is made of: humans, light, sound, visuals, art, and like tapestry into something beautiful that says something that leaves with you that night. So queer time is the using of that time to speak to you about queerness and so that you can enter my world instead of me always entering yours, the cishet imaginary audience. That isn't any of you. <laughs> <laughs> and acknowledging like how uh, time really lines up with the way, the metric of time that we understand. Mm. Our experience of time is rarely ever actually like second to second to second, an yeah, hour, right? It's it, relative, just like queerness. Exactly, ooh, girl. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? So the question was, how much of the writing was informed by the performers? Yeah. yeah. In some ways, all of it, and in some ways, also some of not. Like, the plot was decided before, and the structure was decided before, and I knew that I was doing, like, I knew what the acts were, and I had written what I thought the dialogue would be for those things. And then the reason we did an R&D in the summer was that so I could be reminded of what I thought my instincts were about the performers, and then start to write the script with those voices in mind. So if anyone's ever seen Majit on stage, um, they don't care about your time either. So <laughs> writing a part where they also do that is part of it. If anyone's ever 
seen Sadie on stage is you know that Sadie can hold a room like no one's business. So I knew, and Reese too, and so I knew putting them at the beginning to hold that space. Obviously, if you've seen Chill on stage, you'll know that he uses rage in such an amazing way, etc., etc. You could do it for all of them. And so I was writing for them, but I kind of say like through my filter. And then what would happen is sometimes that filter would really work and they'd go, great, that's bang on me. Sometimes that filter would feel uncomfortable and I'd say, hey, wait a second, see if it feels good later. Then it does. Or sometimes they go, actually, I think I would say it like this. Or actually, I think I would do it like that. And then we'd edit or tweak. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sue, because mm -hmm. although I wrote some of that act free, um, she then like upped a lot of my text and made it a lot better. And she said, actually, this joke would be funnier if I do this. This joke would be better if I went like this. This is more my voice. And she is an incredible comedy writer mm. um, that should be writing comedy for whoever and whenever she wants. And so I kind of say I laid like the groundwork for them to like have all their thoughts on. And that kind of when it goes back to the first question that we had about you know, saying actually they're not divas, they know what they want and there's mm. a difference. Mm -hmm. And actually that's hard to do as a writer when you have eight people. <laughs> but it's actually, if you listen, then it gets the best result because they've been performing as themselves for five, 10, 15 years. Listen to them, Yeah. you know? Yeah, so yeah, it was that mix. Yeah. Wow. Cool. cool. Thank you guys so much for joining us.